Okay. Theta encoding. Why? Why does malware use data encoding? Why does anybody use data encoding? I should say first, by, by data encoding, uh, it can be anything from a proprietary binary format, MS Office files, uh, to actual uh, compression, such as, you know, 7-zip um, or, or G-zip. Um, to, to simple obfuscations such as XOR um, or rotate um, or, or encryption. Um, but the, the purposes can be anywhere from for malware evading detection to just trying to compress the data so it takes up less space. Um, it, it can also increase the complexity, of course because you have to get through that decoding step first before you can figure out what's going on. Um, network traffic, definitely see encoding on network traffic, obfuscation, um, take the, the um, or I guess most of the folks in here would have already taken the uh, PCAP analysis course that uh, Reed had taught um, where he talks about some of that. Um, strings, you see what information you can get just by looking at strings of a binary as well as the import address table. Um, now authors know that, so they'll obfuscate the strings. You know, maybe they don't have you know, some complicated code obfuscations, but at the very least they can put in a simple XOR loop for all of their strings before they use them. And that way when you do a simple string on it, you get less information. Um, and then you have to identify that decode loop and maybe script it, run it on all the strings. Um, payloads, uh, files that get dropped to the system, configuration files. Uh, malware can actually have configuration files. I've seen it. And what they'll do is they'll obfuscate it so that if you find that file on disk, you can't just simply read it and go, oh, the callback is this or this as the backup. And, oh, these are the two persistent locations. Yeah. It also makes it an easy way for um, updating that information. The malware author can just push down a new configuration file. But the whole point is that stuff can get obfuscated on disk. Um, as well as shellcode. See, malicious documents have uh, um, shellcode in them. That can often be obfuscated in some way. Okay. Features. So, some features of encoding functions. Loops. Yay, loops. And how do how does Ida help us identify a loop again? Draws a line in there. <laughs> bold. Yeah. In bold, not just a line, a bold line. <laughs> um, I, I I know it's, it's silly. I, I bring it up again, but but it is actually a useful technique. Look for the bold line. Um, maybe there's some kind of encoding going on there. <clears throat> um, the other piece of it is it has to be reading from somewhere and writing to somewhere. Um, that can often be the same some words, where it's reading from a particular memory location, performing some kind of uh, decoding on it and then writing back to the same memory location and basically overwriting. You see that with your simpler packers that come in and um, the, the simplest technique is add a section. If you have a regular binary, you add a, a, a the packer, adds a new section onto it, makes the entry point point to that new section. And then all that that section will end up doing is the reverse of whatever um, obfuscation mechanism was on the original dot text and, and data our data sections. Um, obviously, those other sections then will have to be marked as uh, writable. And that's something that uh, you can look for as well. Having a, a, um, a code section dot text section that is writable. But that's just one of the, the simpler methods. Um, so like I said, it can um, uh, read from a location and write back to the same location. It's basically 
this right here, you see it move from register two, or the address being pointed to by register two into register one, some kind of processing, and then move the value in register one back to what it pointed to by register two increment. So go on to the next bytes. Back to what you were just saying about the writable text sections and stuff like that. Do you see it more common that they mark that as writable on the file itself or that they virtually protect their own memory to make it writable? Definitely the first one. Okay. Yeah. Definitely the first one on that. Don't don't see a lot of not never, but don't see a lot of the uh, virtual protect. Um, another thing to to keep in mind to remember base plus scale times index. Um, that is another way where where they'll use that if it's not just um, a single byte. If they're doing um, you know every four bytes or sixteen bytes um, some encryption algorithms, then you can see this kind of um, this kind of syntax in the same manner, but with the uh, the index being being incremented and the scale being your 4 or your 16 or some kind of constant. Another thing to look for, load and store using ESI and EDI um, for those who oh want to say that I put the uh, I'm going to have to double check on this. I thought I put the uh, reference for the um, the Intel assembly reference on here since you guys were going to be disconnected. Um, I'll, I'll dig into that. It's not going to be a big deal for this first one, um, but it will be helpful for the next. There's also the Intel assembly uh, instructions that reference that can be very helpful. When you have access to Google, you can Google some of these things if you don't um, remember what they do. Um, Loads, um, and you'll see loads, B for byte, um, D for, for D word. What that will do is it will take um, a look at the ESI register and take the byte or D word that the uh, that memory location in ESI points to, take the byte, D word, what have you, from that and put it into EAX. Um, if it's the D word, it'll put it to EAX. Um, if it's the, the byte, it'll put it into AL. Um, EDI and STOS will do basically the reverse. Take the address in EDI and the byte, D word, what have you, in EA, EAX and store that. Um, by or D word into the memory location pointed to by EDI. The other thing about these is it will then increment ESI for EDI. So what you end up having is you can have this called multiple times without an explicit increment of ESI or increment of EDI. Just be aware of that. If you don't see the increment, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not processing through a memory chunk. Um, another thing to, to help identify encoding functions, um, assuming that there's multiple things that are being, that, that need to be decoded, there's going to be many cross-references to it. Um, and the way that, that you find a cross-reference or where else is this, where is this uh, function or variable being Reference, does anybody remember the shortcut, keyboard shortcut for that? Control I. Oh no. X. No control on it. Just X. Yep. 
a good one to remember. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, that's that's actually a, a good point. The if it is being called, if you do identify a decoding algorithm, decoding function, and it is being called lots of different times, that's a really good way to identify, uh, okay, these are all of the, the places, or these are all the, the strings or blobs of data that I can um, decode. So let me go through and decode those, and that will, will help with the uh, analysis. Let me just renaming the decode function. And then when you come across it elsewhere in the uh, in the code, um, you just need to go, okay, I need to, that's what's going on here, I need to decode that. Okay. 